My name is Scott Shields. I'm the Associate Director and Chief Curator here at the Crocker Art Museum. Gregory Kondos is one of the most important artists in our region. He's one of the best known landscape painters in California and also in the United States. He's part of the National Academy of Design, which is the highest honor that artists can aspire to. And he's been working for more than 50 years painting a variety of subjects, but landscapes are what he's best known for. He comes out of a school of painting in the Sacramento region that includes people like Wayne Tebow, Roland Peterson, Raymond Staprins, who are coming out of a school of artists known as the Bay Area Figurative Painters, and then they've sort of incorporated pop art with that and come up with something that's very unique to the Sacramento region and the Central Valley in California. But it's, it's more important than that, it's broader than that, and Gregory, um, focuses on paint, on color, and on his subjects, and he manages to combine all, all of those things into these beautiful evocations of things like here, you know, grapevines of, from the Napa and Sonoma area, and does them very abstractly, but yet there's no denying what they are. He's also known for his scenes of the Sacramento rivers, the American rivers, um, and also does, does a still life now and again, does some very beautiful paintings of irises, but he has worked really all over the world. He's had a home in France, he's worked there, he works in the American Southwest. Um, he has worked a lot in Yosemite where he's been an artist in residence, um, but he really is primarily associated with, with our region here. Thank you, welcome Mr. Condos. Thank you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Good. And in fact, I am one of your most ardent admirers. Well, you know, my wife does this to me all the time, but I enjoy doing it if it's a good cause. And this one is a very good cause. Uh, I'm older than anybody here, I'm sure. I'm 93. I've been 90 years in Sacramento. I've seen this town from weeds to trees, and uh, I can prove it. I lived in McKinley Park on C Street, and we used to come to town to pick up my father on 5th and K, and we'd have to come through the weeds to get, and follow the uh, streetcar tracks to get into Sacramento at that point, and then back again. I had uh, many adventures in my life, one was a war, which made me grow up, and then uh, I came home and decided to go to school. And uh, to tell a Greek father who can't speak English, you want to be a painter, you're out of your mind. He wants you to be a doctor or a lawyer or something. And so but my father, I love dearly, gave me that go-ahead sign. He said, what are you going to do now that you got through the war? I said, I'm going to go to school. He said, wonderful. He says, okay, now what are you going to take? Uh, I said, I'm going to be an artist, I think. He looked at me and he said, go for it. And that's all I needed. And so I pursued art uh, most of my life. But I found out that the book that I was looking at has been read over and over and over again, and I don't see any results past those heroes that I acquired along the way. Suzanne is my mentor, and when I finally saw him uh, in nature instead of in the book, I knew that tree had to grow somehow, or that field out there. And it took water, and so I followed the river by the way, it's all the way to Rio Vista in pursuit of my uh, paintings. And along the way, I saw color changes and I saw a new life ahead of me. And not much for reading because uh, my span isn't that long, but I'm very good at looking. And uh, thank God it's long. And I do pursue art even now in a wheelchair. I do a lot of, you know, coaching, not teaching, coaching. I want to make sure that the 
person involved is looking at the right thing, if it's the right thing. I'm a teacher of mistakes. I believe in making mistakes, because through mistakes, you can correct them yourself and find out what went wrong. And I, that's it, I think, yeah. Thank you. Work from Mr. Carlos. He is one of my very favorite artists, and we actually share the same dentist. And Mr. Condos one did me that once did me the tremendous favor of meeting with me in the office of my our joint dentist and uh, signing some prints for me. I have a photo that I will always treasure, and I uh, really appreciate you coming here today. Greg has painted the Delta. He started in our storeroom. We have his father's Johnson motor. His father was a fisherman on the Delta, and Greg started out fishing on the Delta. I was asked as we began the Delta Regional Foundation to put on some art shows showing the beauty of the Delta. And our last show was in March and April at Sac State with 56 artists from sculpture <laughs> to <coughs> images, photography, showing agriculture as well as the beauty of the levees. What we are concerned about is that we don't want the Delta to look like Mono Lake. I'm finished. Thank you. Thank you. Money gets upset sometimes because I don't prepare for a lecture, you know, to a crowd or to a school. Uh, I look at the people out there and then I kind of gauge what they want to hear in a way. Do they want to hear about art? Do they want to hear about me or family or what brought me here? That's the important part. And uh, the only ones... <laughs> In many cases, they take me for granted, or like my, my relatives, you know, oh, another kindness lecture or whatever, appearance. And they expect it, and there's no surprise, I guess. But then again, it's not, every word that I put out there is not just for a few, it's for everybody, the masses, especially the young people. They don't know exactly what I went through as a young man, you know, a student, and then all of a sudden a responsible person, which is to teach, and then watch my young people, you know, be successful. But again, in art, it doesn't matter. That's one thing they have to understand. It doesn't matter that at the end of the day, Success is, have you learned anything from it? And if you, you did, uh, then we're on the right track. But a lot of people hope that, you know, I've got that magic word that comes out of a textbook. And it, as far as I'm concerned, most textbooks aren't worth it. Uh, because you have no contact with the area or the painter. I make many trips, you know, to find. I'm like Picasso. I do not seek, I find. And by that, you know, it makes me uh, look, uh, kind of look over my shoulder. Did they hear me, <laughs> you know? And uh, then we can play ball, you know, which is art. I was born in Lynn, Massachusetts. Two wonderful parents. Uh, I wouldn't trade my mother or my father for anybody, really. I had a special guest here yesterday, and he was the, the master, they call him, the head monk in Shanghai. He's a friend of mine. And how did we meet, and how did we hold this friendship eye contact, really. I went to China three times, but and every time he was there waiting for me at the airport, 
wonderful, wonderful man. When he walked through my house door here, I was trembling because I thought I'd never see him again after this Chinese venture. And he is, you know, you can't touch these people. They're holy in the Buddhist world. He hugged me, he kissed me on the cheek. I did the same thing. So what? You know, it's just, this is my kind of world. And he, the kind of world I think he, he prefers. And we hit it off strong. I met him in, uh, at the Buddhist church in uh, Shanghai. I was on a uh, drawing venture and I stayed outside the uh, monastery and Monty went inside to look at the ceremony. But I stayed, I wanted to draw the temple itself, you know. So I put my hat down this, uh, by my side. I wore a hat at all the time, uh, Barcelino. And before I knew it, and I finished drawing the temple, I made three dollars and fifty cents, something like that, in Chinese money. It was funny because people were just dropping in coins, you know, and paper into my hat. And I said, well, that's not bad, you know. And so uh, that's another way of looking at art that if you can't sell, put your hat on the ground and uh, maybe you can get through the week. And so uh, I'm, I joke a lot, but when I talk like this loosely, I'm not joking. And um, I hope that somehow we capture this. Now getting back to where coming from, this is a difficult part. You have loving parents who want to feed you the Greek way, you know, uh, which is uh, lamb and soups, rice, you know, and uh, uh, wonderful spices. And so, um, but I sound like we had it. No, we didn't. My father, uh, he was a real patriot. He uh, went to the, for America, he joined, he volunteered and went into the First World War to France to fight. And he did fight. He went and uh, he fought in the Argonne Forest and he got wounded. And I think he was the first casualty coming that came home uh, after the war and uh, ended up in East Coast, uh, West Coast. We all came out of the East Coast because of Ellis Island in New York. So um, the pattern is like a movie, you know, to now what? You end up, and the first thing, two places that you would go to when you uh, come from Greece. The Cafe Neo is a coffee shop, so you can get acquainted with the community, because most of the men are drinking coffee and, and telling lies, you know, around the table, I guess, their lies. No, I'm, I'll give them the edge, They're, it's the truth. But then the church is a strong uh, message, you know, to any faith uh, person with faith, which I have, but I'm so busy doing community and my work that the church stands by. I decided to give a painting to the Greek community in memory of my mother and father. So I did this painting here because they're coming around with a new section to the, at the Greek church with the Greek school and everything. And I want this to be someplace where all the people can see it. Instead of, you know, I don't, I don't want it to go into the offices like a, that they have for the people that run the community, but put it there where the young kids can see it, especially. The monks used to take the young kids up to the top and save them from the Turks 
when they had the war going on. So that way they also saved the religion and they also not only the religion but the uh, Greek language because if they would have taken over they would have been talking Turkish, you know. And so there's, you know, history is interesting and uh, harmful at times. But so I'm a giver and I do uh, uh, like the city college, state college, state university. I've given them big paintings also because, why, you know, this is where it all happened. So why not? I do work in the studio daily and uh, somehow I managed to get three or four hours a day, and uh, which is plenty. But I do, I'm a uh, quick thinker and I uh, do manage to uh, somehow take over. I have a pole here that if I want to get out of the wheelchair and paint up uh, like a big tall canvas which is behind me, I uh, grab the pole and I straighten up and therefore I reach up in the air and paint on the canvas with the other hand with the brush. And on Saturdays I tell people I go pole dancing, but uh, which is not true, but it sounds good. <laughs> happened, uh, I was not a bright student, you know, in school, like I can't count on my fingers, you know, there's too many of them and things like that. And, but I can listen to philosophy and, and uh, certain people, you know, have made sense to me, like Socrates, you know, he was a Greek, you know. And when he put out the notice that, to the people of Athens that uh, I may not be able to make you do things, but I can make you think. That impressed me. And, but by saying that, he had to give up his life. So he took hemlock. But that part does not fascinate me. It's the idea of what he, when he said, but I can make you think. Okay, that's plenty. That's a teacher in its own. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, then or get somebody else to talk about what I'm, why I'm here. But, um, you know, I'll tell you my mentor is Cezanne, and he said you simplified nature to the simplest form, the sphere, the cone, and the cylinder. Well, when I put that all together, how do you do that? How do you put, you know, a rock with a human being or a tree? I'm the biggest lover of trees. In fact, I have a little lemon tree, which is Greek, the way it, you know the pattern goes. I bought it as a dwarf. It's taller than the three-story house I live in. They made a mistake, but what a mistake. I get beautiful lemons off of that tree, and I respect it. What else is important? Well, to understand what a family is and to find out why I'm Greek, you know, uh, full Greek. Uh, I went to Greece 47 times in my travels. I didn't really go to Athens. I went right straight to my father's and my mother's village. And I learned who my parents, my relatives were. But aside from that, I got involved in baking, cooking, uh, selling like sheep for Easter. I'd stand on the corner with a three or four sheep with a big red dot on her fanny just to keep them from the other uh, pheasants out there to identify who, what sheep belonged to. I, and then I also painted somebody's fishing boat I watched him by the harbor, you know, painfully, pain, pain, yeah, painfully. 
um, putting the stripes around the uh, uh, rowboat and uh, the rest of the boat is white or red or whatever. So I asked the fisherman, can I do that? I'd li just like to uh, get involved with the painting part. And oh, of course, before you knew it, I painted the whole boat, you know. So that's what it, learning is all about. It's uh, not a textbook, it's the guy that can has uh, a pretty way of putting pretty words together. Uh, that doesn't make much sense to me. I, I am a show and tell person. And finally I get to the point where I'm the show and I'm also the tell. And so I uh, brag about that. And uh, my word is real because I've been there. I've experienced what I'm talking about. And uh, this is what I try to convey to young people who think they can get it from a classroom or a textbook, no. That is good reading material. Like my wife loves to watch the late movies. Well, a book is the same thing, you know. But I don't. I'm down here in my studio facing this big white canvas that is burning in front of me. What are you going to put on there? How long will it take? It doesn't matter how long will it take. My experience is some of these paintings, the big ones, I can do in about two days, and the small one takes me a month. So size doesn't mean a thing. And if you have um, other expectations of what makes a painter, I'll get to the story of, my, uh, of why and I chose this profession. Like I said, I had nothing going. I had parents who could not help me survive because they can only speak Greek. And so to communicate, they had to somehow talk the language, English language, because our books here in America are all, they're not Greek and so forth. So it was what, what I can get out of my community and my schools. And uh, I, uh, like I said, you know, I, I would take a class and the teacher would tell me, how about dropping the class? And for example, language, I uh, was pushed into it and I told my advisor, you know, why do I have to take a language when I speak Greek, you know? He said, well, it's customary, you know. And I said, really? And so uh, I took French and the teacher actually, <laughs> God bless her, she was, uh, in fact, my, when I taught at the school, I was her roommate. We, each, we shared the same office. And Virginia said, Greg, how about checking out? You know, it's not for you. And so I said, okay, fine. And we had a house in France. I bought a house, so I'm a house buyer. When I see it, and I have the money, sometimes, you know, I'm really making money, and then right now the market is flat. And I, I, had, I saw it coming, and so I kind of prepared for it, you know. And so uh, I just uh, uh, play, you know, uh, the way the wind blows and succeed. And this is one thing that young people have to learn. Art does not put food on the table. It never has. But what you have to do is make p people uh, realize that you're not in it for the money. You should be for what it can, the magic that you can produce. I remember a Greek painter, Varda, he would put a line on the canvas and he says, see that? That's magic. And then he says, it wasn't there before, was it? But it's there now. And you know, little things like that make so much, 
like a, uh, one teacher I had uh, in painting, he'd put up three fingers, three fingers, three, that's three. No, he says, that's five. So it's the fingers, but he counted the space in between. So there's a, I'd say, okay. <laughs> but that's his way of, message of being cute, I guess, I don't know. Do you remember the first painting you sold? No, but I do remember the first painting I painted, you know. What was it? It was a still life that I went through uh, with Harold Ward at the City College, uh, Junior College then. He was from Boston. He had a bow tie, and I remember that bow tie going up and down when he talked, you know. He had a big Adam's apple. And he fascinated me by his accent, like, uh, uh, like yellow, yeller, you know, or something. He would, his language would go Eastern, his speaking ability. And uh, I used to sit there and take notes about, oh, it's not yellow, it's yeller, you know. And, uh, but aside from that, to, um, I finally hooked up after a few years as I got older with Wayne Thiebaud, who was very big in Sacramento and um, the world, I guess. He's worldwide. I'm worldwide, but he has a gallery that, that promotes in New York, and naturally he's going to get all, all the publicity and sales. Mine are uh, worldwide, but uh, I have to seek, like Picasso. So he's, he's acted as your agent? Well, then? wait a minute, Picasso did not seek, I said, he, I, I do not seek, I find. I find, anyway. But the, um, uh, it didn't hurt me. It helped me, because I had a good friend, and we spent many hours in the countryside searching for what other painters had done and seeing if we can uh, uh, relate to that. Uh, we pursued Maynard Dixon as a painter of the West because he had a certain way of producing light, a light source with his paintings. So we'd go to the open fields in Nevada and uh, look for that light to see if we can bring it uh, onto our work. I finally, you know, uh, went through a, a trial and error situation by going to the uh, junior college, Sacramento, and taking classes from the uh, teachers that were there or the available. And I was uh, uh, as green as could be, and I didn't know what would happen, you know, how successful would they be to get me to understand what art is? But one thing they did teach me, and this is, is fundamentals. I finally realized that uh, how to hold a pencil, how to hold a brush, but it was for what was going on in the area. And uh, see, we had two worlds, the East Coast and the West Coast. So the East Coast was uh, put together by explorers, I, I would call them. They would be looking for something different. We weren't looking for something different here. We were looking for what is an art form and whatever, and uh, maybe a, a saying by Picasso or what. So, uh, Two different worlds, really. But I caught on that my friend Tebow had also looking for that magic world uh, that we both pursued. So it, it didn't make any difference 
of, was he my influence? No. Was I his influence? No. In fact, we uh, generally painted uh, with our backs turned to each other. And then at the end of the day, no time for uh, criticism. We just pack up and go home. We would, um, one cute little incident was that trying to find that magic light of Maynard Dixon's, I had a pickup with a camper on the back. We ended up in a cemetery in Nevada. So we stopped in the, right on top of the tombs, the, uh, the stones, whatever. Uh, I pulled out the barbecue and we started uh, making hamburgers in the cemetery. And then uh, Thibault says, I think we ought to get a hotel, I mean a motel. I said, why? He says, there was a murder here yesterday. He read it in the paper that, on our trip. And I said, don't you worry. I said, I have a 22 rifle. And what we'll do is get in the back of the pickup and then uh, tie ourselves in. And with the 22 rifle, you know, by the uh, bedroll sleeping bag. And so he said, okay. So we, he got out of his sleeping bag and I got my, put him out, stretched out in the pickup. He says, uh, do you have bullets for that rifle? I said, yeah. He says, where? In the glove compartment. Well, here we were tied in like prisoners, you know. And I looked at him and he said, oh my God, you know, now we gotta untie ourselves and get the bullets, you know. But it was crazy things like that that happened that kept us moving on. The war, Second World War broke out. And here my father was trying to raise us kids, three of us. Uh, he had a little barber shop. When he got back from the war, the First World War, wounded, he had something like the GI Bill so he pursued uh, what he thought he knew was to cut hair. And uh, they wanted to put him in a jewelry school, things like that. He couldn't work with it. Just like, I guess I took after him. But he, um, like two bits of haircut, 15 cents a shave, 10 cents for a shower. He had one shower in the back room. Well, that's how he raised this boy and my uh, siblings. So, no regrets. I'd go over through it again if I had to. So, where did you meet your wife? I was, uh, first, uh, well, I was married before. And she happened to be, you know, from her parents who were from Greece where my parents' uh, villages were around there. She was young. She was just uh, like 17, and I said, we were at a wedding. She was a bridesmaid. I said, uh, when do you get out of high school? She says, in two years. I looked at her and I said, we're gonna get married in two years. And that's what happened. And how old were you? 21, something like that. And what was her name? Pardon? What was her name? Rosie. A very beautiful girl for me. Everybody's got their taste. But she gave me two children. One, my daughter and my son. My son is a space engineer. He works on planets and whatever, Mars. And uh, my daughter is a head coach at UCLA in gymnastics. And they, they gave her an award, Coach of the Century. So I'm proud of my kids, you know. But the, uh, I never interfered in their pursuit. Just like my folks never interfered with, when I came out of the Navy, my father gave me a kiss going away and I went to boot camp and from there 
they put me on an aircraft carrier in the Pacific. And so I survived two years at sea uh, fighting the Japanese off of Okinawa, Iwo Jima, and places like that, the Ryukus. And, um, and I came home. But before that, my influence, I guess, came from a Life magazine artist. He came aboard the carrier while we were in dock in, in uh, San Diego. And he pulled out a stool and some art supplies and started drawing the uh, art crew, I mean the uh, flight crew, the airplanes, and whatever was Navy. Wow, I said, that, look at that stuff, all that magic. And so I knew I would, I used to sketch a little bit here and there. I said, I'm gonna try and hook up with this. So when they, I left for the war, my father being a true veteran gave me a kiss. And I said, that was common, but this was special. And I said, what was that all about, Dad? He says, you may not come home. Well, that sunk in, you know. And uh, then I did come home. Then he met me at the train station. And he says, you made it. I said, yep. I look at my father's war picture of him and his army suit and I shed a tear occasionally when I get a little confused at breakfast or something like that. And then my mother, you couldn't replace that woman. She was unbelievable. So how long did they live? What? They weren't around, you know, like my father died you know, 67. My mother, I think, was 62. Here I am 93. And uh, they're, they're looking out for me, believe me. It's not all money. At this point, you know, uh, like I said, the market is flat right now and I'm ready for it. And so I can survive. Young people who have just a fresh start now, they're looking around wondering what the heck happened because they're not getting that call where I need a painting, could you do one for me or do you have one? The message is not there right now. What do you attribute to it being flat? What's well, I, I said, well the, you have to become commercial and think that way. To make a, a sale is what we're, what we're talking about here because that puts the food on the table and that's what you pay your bills with. You have no other source but your art. And, uh, but like I said before, uh, I've made sure that the community is res responsible for my uh, interests and because I would paint, believe me, uh, even if nobody wanted a painting, to be honest with you, I would do something else. I've, I've worked any uh, bartender, uh, grocery stores, uh, everything that's out there, believe me, I've handled at wages like two dollars, a dollar a week, eight hours a day. No, no complaints, but that was the hard times, you know, in the world. We have, we're having a tough time right now, but our demand is bigger. The, we have to make money to survive, unless you want to go with the government. I want a studio, I want a house, I want a car. I want my children to be raised with a good education. I work for it. Do you think that uh, the government should have like a WPA again to no. hire artists? And no, because and the easier it comes, you know, there's a, I've always felt that there's a group of whatever people 
that are looking for something that they don't really have to work for. Let the government take care of it. Well, why live, you know? They asked me that question, uh, why am I a painter at the museum? And I says, why paint? Why live? So my pursuit is, I'm going to paint anyway, see, and uh, do the best I can and, and within my means. And uh, I, I help, I don't know, you know, I, I don't show it, and it's not as big as the, dyna, and the people in the business world, but I do help people that try and they don't have much. I loan them the money or I give them the money. They don't have to pay me back, but they do. Now, did you teach at some school here? I you taught here at the city college and uh, for 20 years, but I also have done many workshops around the world. And I've also, uh, locally here, I lecture to especially grammar schools. I love little kids. One little boy came up to me at the Crocker when I had my big show and I was signing books. And he said, and he was just a little guy, second grader. And he says, Mr. Connors, can I shake your hand? Oh boy, that was it. I said, of course you can. So I hugged him and then he stepped back and looked at me. He said, you are amazing. That's all I needed, you know. That is the reward that I've been looking for. And it came from, his, and I never got his name and I'm mad at myself. I probably would have adopted him, I don't know. But there are people that have to be shown, told early and let them decide. So when you teach your classes, after I've heard you say that you can't really learn from textbooks, what can you teach them that other teachers can't teach them? I don't teach by the book. And I don't lecture by the book. I don't uh, give, give formal lectures to the community by the book. Monty says, are you ready to talk to this group? I said, of course. She said, well, I don't see any notes. And well, I don't need them. I says, I have enough in the back of my head. And when I look at the crowd out there, I know exactly what to tell them. And I generally end up right, you know, I made the right decision. Uh, uh, dates and things like that, I can always go back and find them. But experience, I have to walk through that uh, with my heart. Tell me about your love for the Delta. I chose Sacramento, my father did, because of the produce, you know, the um, agricultural part, you know, and all the Greeks look for the warm weather and that kind of work if we're coming over to this country. My name, for example, true name is Kondoravdis, and uh, they, at Ellis Island they cut it down to Condis. So now we're, we're Americans, I guess. But the, uh, uh, I wouldn't have it any other way. Uh, I find myself, uh, like this last month or so, very busy. I just went through that sidewalk thing, that uh, Hall of Fame or whatever. Then I had to give a lecture at the... Wait, what, what are you talking about, the Hall of Fame? Uh, those are titles. I don't know what they are, to be honest with you, except that I connected someplace with somebody or a group of people. And uh, that's why I don't take notes or anything. I'm like I'm talking to you, that's the way I lecture. And I think it comes across a lot better. And uh, 
We're not, oh, well, let me see, that date was, uh, you know, that's ridiculous. I'm a joker too, you know, I, I, I have a sense of humor. In Egypt, I took a group over there and it was King Tut's opening, you know, they discovered, uh, opened up his tomb. So we got to go into the pyramids that he was in. And so everybody went to lunch and I stayed back because right down below me was the big hole that they had the, the coffin of King Tut's. So I heard footsteps coming into the pyramid. So I quickly jumped in the hole, laid down flat, and crossed my arms, like as if I was gone, you know. That, well, all of a sudden, the, the, like high heels, they stopped, and the scream, this woman here just went through hell, I guess, getting out of the pyramid. She thought I was dead. And I got a big kick out of that, you know. So, but uh, I discovered even a, an Egyptian and things roll in my head somehow. Right now, I haven't got time for that because I have shingles and that goes on for, you know, a long, I've had them on almost a year. They haven't gone away yet. But I managed to work, you know, with it. Um, I'm a tough nut, you know. Well, obviously, your work has kept you alive. Oh yeah, it's, uh, you hit it right on the head there. When I come down to my studio, I uh, take a deep breath, and it's all turpentine practically. But I open the doors, and I work through the day. If that's how long it'll stay. It's generally about four or five hours. And then I work through large and small paintings. But I can sense that this is what is keeping me alive, is to be able to connect with uh, my heroes. And not yet, not yet, you know, whatever. And uh, the day will come, sure. But the... Uh, I, like my friend Sayop, I don't know if you know him or not. They asked him at a bar mitzvah to come up and talk. So he got up on the stage and everybody clapped. He says, thank you, thank you, thank you. He says, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be anywhere. Well, that's just about with me. I'm glad to be so, anywhere. I, I even bought a house in France because I love the current countryside and the painters that made it happen. So I'm part of history. Do you when still have the house? I just sold it not too long ago because my kids, I knew they were so busy with their profession. They'd, they'd go over there once they could rent a place. But the people that bought it, the two young men, they bought the, it was 300 years old, this house. Oh, you know, a beautiful sight. Like I can just see the impressionists working, you know. Uh, they said, uh, Greg, if you ever want to come back, we'll move out of the house and you can stay there as long as you want. And uh, we have other places, you know. So that's a welcome that I never used because I'm too old and right now I'm in a wheelchair. If I hadn't have fallen and, and up in my bathroom on the tile, I, I uh, fractured my pelvis in two places. And so that's kept me crippled up somewhat. Uh, I do have good days, mostly, and a few bad days. And if I see it coming, I go to bed, you know, Thanks. just to rest up, yeah. Your first wife, did she die or? Oh yeah, she passed away. Rosie, wonderful mom, had a sense of humor and also a, a gift of seeing her children grow up to be what they were. I give her full credit. And, uh, and I said I'd never get married again. 
Then money came around, yeah. and uh, changed, my, changed my mind, you know. I that? saw, well, I saw the energy that she had. So where did you meet her? Where? Yeah, when, where and when? I can't tell you because I don't keep track of dates. Maybe 15 years ago. And she made a difference in many ways. She came from an art family. Her brother was unbelievable. The guy was a great artist. Uh, but more decorative than what I do. And um, he died. But um, Amani's been by my side all these years. And uh, we argue, of course we do. Uh, that's the way life is. But it's always trying to help each other. And uh, you don't dare say, oh, I like those beans we had the other night at the festival. Because she'll go out and buy beans and trying to replica what she, what I was talking about. She's a pleaser. She wants to please all the time. And the community just loves her. And she's a full person. I, uh, I have my days, you know, and, and, uh, and mainly because my mind, and I'm not joking, is w waiting to put together the next painting. I just dream about all these canvases you see in front of you. When did you start painting? Like, I, I remember the house okay. painted out on the Delta, um, on the levee there? I lived there, you know, in uh, Clarksburg, you know, for oh, 10 years or so. I had the vineyards, I had the, uh, that's my morning walk, walking from the uh, highway to the back road to the uh, still wa The water is still is black. It doesn't move. And uh, I wouldn't drink it. And, uh, but it's, the growth around it is un untouchable. It's beautiful. But the, the Delta, if it wasn't for the Delta, I wouldn't be here. We get that Delta breeze at night and we don't need anything, air conditioner or whatever. We open the windows and we get that breeze. But to understand uh, my blue color, which I'm noted for uh, in most of the paintings of the skies, see my blues. Well, anyway, um, that comes from observation by, I had a little boat I bought up in Placerville, a little rowboat for $25. And I used to take that on, and park it on the river. And I'd go out there and, and row. I didn't have a motor out in the middle of the river and lay down. I wouldn't, and then I had a fishing pole, but I'd tie it to the boat. And I'd lay down and look at the sky and fall asleep sometimes. But I just loved that, that breeze, that air coming off the river. And then uh, when they put restrictions on it, everything dried up, a lot of it. It was heartbreaking, really. And that's my river. That's my levee. That's my tree. And now you want to take it away because they don't want to pursue the, the sea and get the water out of there, you know, for the homes to water and drink, of course. They have that, that uh, all scientifically figured out. So we've, we worked for this delta and just like that, they want to disrupt million people or so. And uh, we can stand at the Capitol and aim our cars in four different directions. And we're there within an hour. 
because of the Delta, you know. And uh, I don't care how much we have, it's not very much violence in Sacramento. It could be worse, but it just seems like all these trees, we are a town of trees, and that comes from the Delta. The growth needs, we need the water, and not only for uh, our trees and lawns, but we need it to run our factories and whatever canneries. And we, uh, I can make it, I'm not good at the, I'm not a good politician, and uh, because if I was, I'd probably go to jail. You know, they, I'd say the wrong thing. And the, I'm, I'm really um, upfront. I don't want to make, you know, a world of, I would hate myself to favor something which I didn't want, you know, working. And the, the Delta, I can go out there with a sleeping bag or do what, anything and uh, enjoy the, the week, not only the day. And uh, I've done so many good paintings in my life and they were from the, the Delta. That's being selfish though, see? And I don't want to sound like it's for me because of my art, but my art conveys what is the Delta, you know? I remember a write-up, some guy, uh, somebody, uh, writer said, what is the Delta Breeze? Well, uh, call up Condis and he'll tell you. Well, I couldn't give him an answer really because it's personal and uh, I know it my way. You know, I used to go down to the Weir over here to go duck hunting when I was a teenager. And me and my buddy would go out there in the middle of the uh, bypass over there with the, um, and just lay down with our shotguns. And we all around us, we'd hear these ducks uh, also laying down to sleep around us, uh, feet away. Then all of a sudden when the light would come on, which the, the, the day, the sun, they would fly up, and then we'd have our shoot and go home. But it was uh, the rice areas uh, uh, going up towards woodland and so forth were magic also for birds. You know, here's something that I have to get off my chest. We have a, I was asked to do the painting of the uh, river on the north part for the airport. And uh, somehow they got what they wanted from me, but I thought I was the major because the first uh, part of the airport, it was mine. I've got f all kinds of art uh, in glass uh, depicting the river and so forth. When, when this came around, somebody got it from not uh, California. He came from Colorado and uh, it was supposed to be a California project and it was that stupid rabbit they had at the airport. I call it the syphilitic rabbit, you know. I'm open on that. And uh, I've never seen my painting that's there. I don't want to see it because they, they did a, a number on me by uh, bringing in this guy from Colorado. And the difference in pay was enormous thousands of dollars more and I'm, I wasn't a after that because I cut mine in practically in half just because I felt this is my home and uh, let's go for it. I got it off my chest. But anyway, it's, uh, 
Uh, I don't like that rabbit, to be honest with you. Do we have rabbits anymore? No. That was in the days of my mother and father when we shot rabbits to eat. And a lot of them were sick, like they had boils. My mother would cut the boils out and uh, do a, you know, roast the, the rabbit or something. But that was food to put on the table. And then all of a sudden we had to make it our, like the eagle being for the U.S., the rabbits for California. Come on. It doesn't work that way. And uh, I just don't, uh, this, there is no place in America, I, except Yosemite, that I would live in. Yosemite's magic. I've done many pictures of Yosemite, yeah. And I've, uh, you know, I, I'm a, uh, like a pet lion, I guess, to the people of Yosemite. I've done some real nice workshops and, and uh, a record of Yosemite. But that, to me, is a couple hours away from Sacramento. Home base is right here, and uh, I will end here. You got more out of me than... <laughs> oh, I'm serious. Good. I felt like talking today. Good. But it, it, I just, uh, I want the, what I can, to me is to enjoy, like I do, my surroundings, is to have young people listen to you talk. And I say that because they've got a mind that is growing constantly and they're just ready to make a, a step forward. And some may be, want to be a, a painter like me. If I could reach them, well, thank you, God. You have love in each other, you're, you're responsible for them and you want them to have, you know, a good f start and a ending in life. So let them decide, let them make mistakes. Uh, eventually they may come around to what you believe in, but they have to live with it. You, you know, you're, you'll be on your way and they are just starting, so they have to make decisions. And if it's going to be art, boy, that's a tough one to say, there I am, I'm like I did, facing my father and saying, I, I want to go to art school. That was very difficult. And, but he took it so beautifully, you know, by saying, just go for it. I always feel secure with the brush this far away that I can come in and you know but I'd always have that much distance between the hand and the point of contact and then I can move around much easier. I call her the lady, Lady Liberty. Uh, was in my, actually up to upstairs here in my brain quite a while before I even thought I would do one. And the purpose of this is to kind of pay back my folks a little bit. They were immigrants that came through Ellis Island and had to pass by the Statue of Liberty and uh, my father became a real patriot, and so this is very much his baby, you know. And uh, but I'm not going to give him full credit. If it turns out, my mother was just as much uh, involved, keep me safe and happy and healthy. And uh, so they're gone. But their memories still, you know, live on with me. 
And I don't know if there's a better tribute to both of them for challenging a new world without knowing the language and starting a family and being very successful in the results. And uh, I'm very proud of my heritage and my people. So this is, to me, uh, just another way of looking at life, one that I could create with a brush and the other one by memories. The process is very slow on these types of compositions. Like the background, I'm not happy with it yet, but I will be, I'm getting close. I'll probably put down another layer, and if I do a blue, it'll be uh, with gray in it, so I, it won't be so bright and so demanding. So uh, I'll wait until this coat of blue dries, and then I'll uh, start working on the final coat. But in the meantime, I'll pick at it and either make the so-called the cloth part of the uh, liberty uh, more with texture and movement and then finally I'll say okay baby I'll put this wrap this big blanket of blue around you hoping it's not too bright of a blue I just want to the uh, the statues would take over and become the dominating force in the composition. This is the fun part, pushing it back and forth, back and forth, until finally, uh, sometimes some of these paintings come off with one uh, trick of the brush. It has to be a trick because I use arm movement and body movement to create brush strokes. So um, it's just a uh, teacher that I personally put together. And that's the one that taught me how to do a brush stroke, how to mix a color, how to apply it. And uh, then I'm on my way of, of completing my little story, if I have one. Sometimes it becomes mechanical, and just go through the you know strokes. But um, it's it's more than that. It's a part. It's really part of me that I have stored away and decided to release. And. Uh, the outcome is different in most cases on my different uh, compositions. But see, like looking at the Statue of Liberty now, I notice my brush strokes are going in uh, downward or upward, if you want. Uh, that's the control I've got about how the folds should happen. And the, all the dark lines that you see are done with charcoal. And then I apply the color on top of that and try to uh, make them uh, roll easily. Instead of like a hard line, they'll end up like dark and light, little patterns of dark and light. But I kept the uh, figure, the head away for the moment. I don't want to touch it because I just like how serious the statue is as I look at her. And I don't want to lose that. So if I can finish the body and with the torch and the book and whatever and the stand, then get right back into the main portion, which is for me the crown and the head and the stretch of the arm. I think I've got the right hand side pretty well uh, controlled. 
Now the white clouds in the background, I put it purposely so you can feel that this is an outdoor subject matter. And uh, they become quite abstract because the figure to me is quite abstract. It's not realism to like using a toothpick to put the color patch down. I use big brushes and small brushes. And you'd be surprised how far I reached to get just one stroke on the canvas. When I die, I guess that's the, nobody likes to use that word. Uh, they can put on my gravesite, student. I've got a doctorate, I've got a master's, I've got them all, but student is the right one because that's our world. We have to make mistakes, and I believe in making mistakes, and through the mistakes we correct them, and that schooling as far as I'm concerned.